Have you ever thought, there's got to be a better and simpler way to learn organizational strategies? 5 Minutes Learning has a global and diverse collection of case studies to help management students click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to stay updated with our upcoming and interesting case studies. Hey guys, have you ever heard of General Electric? Of course you have, it's one of the world's leading industrial companies. But did you know that it was founded way back in 1878 by none other than Thomas Edison himself? That's right, the guy who invented the light bulb. Over the years, General Electric has grown and expanded its business to include power generation, household appliances, lighting, aircraft engines, medical systems, and diesel locomotives. Talk about diversity. But it's not just about the products they make. General Electric has always been at the forefront of management practices, constantly evolving and changing with the times. In the 1930s, they had a highly centralized and tightly controlled corporate structure, but by the 1950s, they had decentralized and delegated responsibility to hundreds of department managers. And when they hit a rough patch in the 1960s, they developed sophisticated strategic planning systems to get back on track. Then came Reg Jones, the CEO before Jack Welch. He took strategic planning to a whole new level, turning it into an art form. And he wasn't just focused on business, he also became the country's leading business statesman and was voted CEO of the year three times in the 1970s. When he retired in 1981, the Wall Street Journal called him a management legend and praised Welch as the perfect successor. So there you have it, folks. General Electric isn't just a company, it's a trendsetter in management practices and a powerhouse in industrial diversity. Hey guys, welcome to this video where we talk about one of the most successful CEOs in history, Jack Welch. Back in 1981, when Welch became the CEO of GE, the U.S. economy was in a recession. High interest rates and a strong dollar make it difficult for businesses to succeed. But Welch knew that to succeed, he had to make big changes. He challenged each of GE's businesses to become better than the best, and set in motion a series of changes that would radically restructure the company over the next five years. Welch's motto was, number one or number two, fix, sell, or close. He wanted GE to be the best or second best competitor in every industry, or he would disengage. Welch knew that to make GE a unique, high-spirited, entrepreneurial enterprise, he had to invest in productivity and quality, stay on the leading edge of technology, and make contiguous acquisitions. Welch made some tough decisions and sold off more than 200 businesses, including central air conditioning, housewares, coal mining, and even GE's well-known consumer electronics business. Between 1981 and 1990, GE freed up over $11 billion of capital and invested more than $21 billion in major purchases such as Westinghouse's lighting business, Employers Reinsurance, RCA, Kidder Peabody, and Thomson, CGR. Welch also knew that GE needed to become more lean and agile, he eliminated 59,290 salaried and 64,160 hourly positions through downsizing, destaffing, and delayering between 1981 and 1988. Even when offset by the acquisitions, the number of employees at GE declined from 404,000 in 1980 to 292,000 by 1989. Welch's restructuring efforts paid off. Between 1981 and 1985, revenues increased modestly from $27.2 billion to $29.2 billion, but operating profits rose dramatically from $1.6 billion to $2.4 billion. This set the base for strong increases in both sales and earnings in the second half of the decade. We hope you learned something new about Jack Welch's successful restructuring of GE. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more exciting content. Today, we're talking about the legendary Jack Welch, former CEO of General Electric, 
GE, and how he turned the company into a powerhouse through a radical cultural shift. By the late 1980s, GE had gone through major restructuring, but Welch knew that there was still more work to be done to create the best possible company culture. Welch wanted to create a place where all employees felt engaged and had a voice, and to do this, he launched two major initiatives, Workout and Best Practices. Workout was a process designed to get unnecessary bureaucracy out of the system while providing a forum in which employees and their bosses could work out new ways of dealing with each other. Each consultant facilitated off-site meetings with 40 to 100 employees, allowing them to share their views about their business and how it might be improved. Bosses were asked to listen to their employees' analyses and recommendations and make instant decisions about each proposal in front of everyone. By mid-1992, over two-thirds of the GE workforce had participated in workout, and productivity increases doubled to a 4% annual rate between 1988 and 1992. Welch's relentless pursuit of productivity also resulted in the best practices movement, which focused on learning from other companies that were achieving higher productivity growth than GE. Many GE managers began to realize they were managing and measuring the wrong things, and several units began radically revising their whole work approach. Let us know in the comments below what you think about Welch's approach to business, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more great content. In the 1980s, internationalization wasn't a priority for GE, but thanks to amazing advocates like Paolo Fresco, the president of GE Europe, they started to see the value in going global. Welch knew the importance of creating a solid base at home first, but he didn't want to impose a one-size-fits-all strategy on his businesses. He encouraged each business to take responsibility for its own globalization plan. But that didn't mean Welch wasn't involved. In fact, he raised the bar on GE's performance standard in 1987 and emphasized the importance of a world market position. And just a few months later, GE made a major deal with Thomson SA, exchanging its struggling consumer electronics business for the French company's leading medical imaging business. Welch knew that going global wasn't a one-time effort, so he appointed Paolo Fresco as head of international operations in 1989 to keep the momentum going. Fresco continued to broker international deals, like a joint venture with Robert Bosch and an acquisition of Sovac. And as Eastern Europe opened up, he spearheaded the purchase of a majority share in the Hungarian lighting company, Tungs Ram. GE invested $17.5 billion in Europe between 1989 and 1995, half on new facilities and half on acquisitions. And when the Mexican peso collapsed in 1995, GE saw it as a great buying opportunity and acquired 16 companies within six months, positioning the company for the country's recovery. Even when Asia faced a crisis in 1997-1998, Welch urged his managers to see it as a buying opportunity rather than a problem, and GE spent $15 billion on acquisitions in Japan alone. By 1998, GE's international revenues were almost double what they were five years earlier, and the company expected to do almost half its business outside the United States by 2000. This was a remarkable achievement considering that only 20% of GE's business was outside the U.S. in 1985. And most importantly, global revenues were growing at almost three times the rate of domestic sales. In this video, we are talking about one of the most iconic business leaders in history, Jack Welch, and how he completely transformed the corporate culture at GE. Welch recognized that in order to make GE a global leader, he needed to realign the mindset of the company's 290,000 employees with the new strategic and organizational imperatives. He wanted to redefine the implicit contract that GE had with its employees and create an environment in which people could be their best. Welch believed that good people were GE's key assets and had to be managed as a company resource. Welch used GE's well-established human resource systems to adapt his goals, and he spent most of his time teaching and developing his employees. 
He even traveled twice a month to GE's management development facility, Crotonville, to interact with employees and teach them his vision. Welch's major effort was to create an environment in which people could be their best. And he did this by implementing a compensation package that incentivized his employees. He radically overhauled GE's compensation package by making stock options the primary component of management compensation. He also expanded the number of option recipients and made more aggressive bonus awards and option allocations that were strongly tied to individual performance. Welch's ultimate goal was to create a place where people have the freedom to be creative, a place that brings out the best in everybody. An open, fair place where people have a sense that what they do matters, and where that sense of accomplishment is rewarded in the pocketbook and the soul. So there you have it, guys. Jack Welch transformed GE's corporate culture, creating a place where employees were empowered to be their best, and it was all thanks to his vision and his commitment to developing his people. Today, we're talking about the incredible transformation of GE in the 1990s, the third wave. Jack Welch, the CEO at the time, knew that the company needed to be rebuilt urgently, even in the midst of an industrial slowdown. Welch had a vision for GE that was boundaryless, a company where there were no barriers between engineering, manufacturing, marketing, sales, and customer service, and where domestic and foreign operations were all on the same level. This meant that GE would be as comfortable doing business in Budapest and Seoul as it was in Louisville and Schenectady. Welch understood that the key to success was to create a culture that encouraged sharing and seeking new ideas, regardless of where they came from. Managers from Canadian GE, for example, identified a small New Zealand appliance maker called Fisher & Paykel that was producing a broad range of products very efficiently. The Canadians used their techniques to increase productivity in their high-volume factory, and soon the U.S. appliance business became interested. More than 200 managers and employees went to Montreal to study the accomplishments, and soon a quick response program had cut the U.S. production cycle in half and reduced inventory costs by 20%. Welch also changed the criteria for bonuses and awards to reward idea-seeking and sharing, not just idea creation. This created an environment where ideas and expertise could spread throughout the company, and where productivity solutions from lighting, transaction effectiveness from GE Capital, cost reduction techniques from aircraft engines, and global account management from plastics were all shared and utilized. The most impressive example of this was the company's integration model, which guided managers in any part of the company responsible for integrating a newly acquired operation. By the late 1990s, GE's integration programs were completed in about 100 days. Welch knew that there was no place at GE for people who weren't boundaryless. If you were turf-oriented, self-centered, didn't share with people, and weren't searching for ideas, you didn't belong there. It was all about working together and removing any barriers that got in the way. Hey guys, have you ever heard of the concept of stretch targets? It's all about using your dreams to set business targets, with no real idea of how to get there. And who better to introduce it than Jack Welch, the legendary CEO of GE in the early 1990s? Welch wanted to change the way targets were set and performance was measured, by creating an atmosphere that asked of everyone, how good can you be? And that's exactly what he did with Stretch. Managers had to set higher, stretch, goals for their businesses, in addition to hitting basic targets. And those who achieved them were rewarded with substantial bonuses or stock options. And guess what? It worked. Within a year of introducing the concept of stretch, Welch was reporting progress. Decimal points were boring and uninspiring, and GE aimed for the impossible, like 10 inventory turns and 15% operating margins. Of course, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Stretch targets could easily degenerate into a justification for forcing people to work 60-hour weeks to achieve impossible goals. 
But as long as the don't punish failure concept was honored and people were encouraged to think of fundamentally better ways of performing their work, stretch targets were a huge success. So even though GE didn't meet all of its stretch targets, they learned to do things faster and better than ever before. And they had enough confidence to set new stretch targets of at least 16% operating margin and more than 10 turns by 1998. If GE can achieve the impossible with stretch, who says you can't too? So what are your stretch targets? Let us know in the comments below. Hey guys, have you ever heard of the A players with the four E's? No, we're not talking about a band or a sports team. We're talking about how General Electric CEO Jack Welch transformed the company by focusing on exceptional leadership talent. Welch realized that in order to leave a legacy of excellence, he needed to create a culture of high standards and exceptional performance. He wanted only the best of the best, or as he called them, uh, players. These individuals were characterized by their vision, leadership, energy, and courage. But how did Welch identify these A players? He looked for individuals with the four E's, energy, the ability to energize others, edge, and execution. These were the individuals who were excited by ideas and attracted to turbulence because of the opportunity it brings. They were also able to infect everyone with their enthusiasm for an idea and have everyone dream the same big dreams. They had the ability to make tough calls and the consistent ability to turn vision into results. Welch also implemented a performance appraisal system that required every manager to rank each of his or her employees in one of five categories. The top 10% were 1S, the strong 15% were 2S, the highly valued, 50% were 3S, the borderline, 15% were 4S, and the least effective, 10% were 5s. Every group, even a 10-person team, had to be ranked on this so-called vitality curve. All 1s and most 2s received stock options, but anyone rated a 5 had to go. Welch knew that nurturing and continuously upgrading the quality of management was one of the main keys to GE's success. He felt that the talent he had amassed over the past 18 years was of significantly higher quality than in past years. I've got all the players in the corporate council. It wasn't like that before. I'm really pleased about that, he said. So, if you want to succeed like GE, focus on finding and nurturing your A players with the four E's. Don't settle for mediocrity, aim for excellence. Thank you so much for listening to this video. Do not forget to subscribe this YouTube channel for receiving updates about my upcoming case study videos.